Right on. Well, let's take a little detour for a moment and then we'll we'll tie these two worlds together. You know, I know in your mind everything sort of fits seamlessly together already, but but you happen to sort of have another side of your background, which is, you know, deep in the world of blockchain and, and non-fungible technology. For those that don't know, you were the guy that came up with sort of smart NFTs and that was a big breakthrough. It's it's changed my life. It's changed my career. You know, I, I never would have started the show Edge of NFT or, or done all these events globally. So um, there's a bit of a domino effect in the world uh, that you you created there. And I'm, I'm grateful to you for that. What where did you come up with this idea? And, and, and when you when you started this, what were some of the use cases that came to mind? So. It's interesting. The I had been exposed to blockchain technologies, you know, quite quite a bit earlier. I was looking at it from more of an enterprise perspective, which is a lot of my work has been. I was getting increasingly frustrated with the enterprise adoption of blockchains. One because they were being applied to problems they don't actually, they shouldn't be applied to. A lot of the stuff that they were being applied to was better done centralized. Other things were there was a lot of regulatory uh, issues that were creating a molasses pace. Um, uh, but I always believed very early on that the most important innovation about this shift to a, a next generation internet, an internet that would uh, be more equitable, more empowering to, to everyone and not just concentrate power, would start with the idea of self-sovereign ID, would start with the idea that you own your own stuff. Ownership uh, is not a concept that was built into the internet. Information, free flowing of information and ubiquitous and low cost access to it was built in, but you don't own uh, um, the, uh, you, when you go to one website or another, you're not you, you're registering as into their system. They're making you an identity. They own the data They're You're signing away into that world. And then you go somewhere else and you're another you again, owned by someone else. So I, I've been fa was fascinated by that. Started working in that space, and one day I was sitting um, at my uh, bar, thinking about this dilemma and the uh, the unbelievable complex nature of what was facing us with applying blockchains to reordering the financial system and all these things about real estate and uh, big institutions, banks. And I was like, I, all the other way, <clears throat> all the way the other way. And start with the notion of the most basic primitive, which is <clears throat> I'm me and I have a beer. And I happen to be sitting there with a beer in this plane of reality, right? So I'm thinking if you have the internet as a social and ownership overlay, uh, the next generation of the internet as a social ownership overlay on the last one, then I need to be me, I need an identity, and I need to be able to have my beer. So what if I could have that beer? And it was not like a Bitcoin, because at the time, all, all tokens were fungible. Everything was like everything else. You, you don't take one Bitcoin versus another. You can't see a Bitcoin. You can't poke it. Um, <clears throat> Ethereum was out. But again, the Ethereums were all like one another either. There was no ERC-721 or anything like that. So was, the, the concept was, what if I could take a beer uh, that was unique? It's my beer, and I'm a human, and I could put it on the table. And now I didn't have it anymore because I'm still here, but the beer is now uh, in the table and it can be seen in augmented reality. Somebody else could pick it up and now they have it. So I, something that I owned went to someone else and then that they could give me a real beer and i.e. a physical beer. So this idea that suddenly a digital object could have uh, physical properties could be unique in and of itself and retain its value as it moved from person to person or from person to business and then could be magical programmable could change state the beer could burst into confetti if the lakers got over 100 points and turn into a taco or if it was left out too long and didn't uh, didn't get picked up by someone it could start to get warm and lose its value you it, it's just a programmable mini object but it has the advantage on a blockchain of being unique uniquely identifiable traceable and scarce you now have what I believed at the time would be a revolution in, in, in the nature of human engagement. If I give you something 
then you are someone in the system. You have you are someone with something. And if you put in the right permissions and allow me to connect to you, you now have a direct conduit of communication. If Budweiser gave you that beer and you said, thank you, Budweiser, and they said, don't worry about it. You want another or you want to talk? <laughs> you can say yes. You don't have to ask permission to, for these intermediaries anymore to, uh, to talk to your own customers, to talk to your own audiences, to talk to your own fans. You can now emerge with a uh, economy of value instead of annoyance. So my belief was if we could lay down that, that, that system, advertising would go away, replaced with a new value-based economy. And digital objects would become one of the most prevalent form of communication and the most powerful communication medium in the history of humanity would then become the wallet, your representation of your identity and your ability to decide personally who you want to interact with and when. And that was the beginning of what we um, then called um, Vatum. So uh, everyone thought that NFT was too geeky a, a word, like non-fungible token, like no one's gonna get what that even is. I certainly, I, I, I'm certainly believe that nobody, that that would never take off and nobody would ever call it an NFT. So when thinking about what I really wanted to see with this, uh, I was thinking about the dissolution of the boundaries between uh, bits and atoms. And, and uh, if you could make something out of imagination that was no less real than something made out of atoms, then you'd, you'd start a revolution. And that's what we called it, the Vatom, the virtual atom. And that became the first NFT. And when was that? Early 2015. Yeah. So way back before uh, Crypto Kitties. And um, in fact, before I even learned about blockchain, um, you were already thinking about, you know, what we call these days NFTs. It's 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 mind blowing. It's it's there's another sort of conversation we probably have to have on our other show, Edge of NFT. But I am curious when you sort of look at all the use cases that have come up here since since that point in time, are there any that surprise you? And are there any use cases that, you know, when you mix with AI that you think are, are sort of readily accessible in the next run of utilizing this technology. Yeah, for sure. Um, some things didn't surprise me or us. It was a merry band of really smart folks that came together to pursue this. Um, but some things did like, you know, we knew, I certainly uh, felt that the first use cases of anything tend to be things like gambling. So, so, you know, if you can make something scarce, every five-year-old that draws something on a napkin is going to throw it in and sell it, <laughs> you know, and people will speculate on it and what have you, but it was never really interested in that speculative economy so much. Um, sure. It's good. If you have, you have to, if, if you own something, you have to have the right to sell it. It's, it's, it's part of the nature of ownership, give it to someone and get value. But I was much more interested in how this can be used for things like um, like like uh, engagement and gathering data in an ethical and legal way and uh, creating um, patent systems or a real estate title or uh, entitlements for food. I can send you uh, policy based uh, tokens that could be uh, translated into electricity or gas or groceries, but can't be used for X, Y or Z. That allows a different type of value to be sent, programmable policy-based money. Uh, and, and I really felt like that was the most interesting thing. Plus, coming from an enterprise background and the relationships that we have with the you know, telcos and credit card companies and banks and uh, consumer good companies, it became very um, natural to start to think about some of the early practical examples there. But if you really look at the bigger picture, and I wouldn't say it's surprising, I would say it's gratifying uh, of what's happening now. Not only is this becoming mainstream, I think commonplace people are starting to recognize that this is just gonna be how things work, but we're starting to see the emergence of really the, the, the most important aspect of, of where this might lead, which is everyone on the planet having a, a wallet, everyone on the planet owning their own data, and everyone on the planet 
being able to transact and express themselves and get paid. This is not just about top-down content. It's not just about selling you stuff or brands being able to, uh, to, to address you. Even brands want to empower you, right? This be, when you have a value-based economy, you're moving from advertising and annoying people. You're trying to find ways to align better with people, uplift them, create a connection. And sometimes that comes through delivering content and delivering um, gamification or something interesting to do. Sometimes it comes from enabling people to connect with one another in next generation communities and express themselves. But the most important thing that I think is what's, what's interesting is this idea of decentralization, it's pretty, it's pretty darn real. Like if you think about what, what happens, sure, a lot of it is, is bastardized now or not needed in places it was trying to put, but imagine what happens if everyone has their own self-sovereign ID and the ability to, um, to, to get a stable coin. Like imagine that, imagine I can send you a penny uh, in another country for free and you can take it out in your local currency. Now imagine that that penny was a stable coin that also paid some yield. Imagine you're sitting in an inflationary economy, I don't know, Venezuela or somewhere that by the time someone gives you $5 for, for milk, you can't afford it anymore because the inflation's gone up. You can take your money, you can put it under your mattress. Someone can steal it. You can take your money, put it in a bank. The bank can close. The bank could freeze it. Uh, inflation's still going up. What if you had a, um, a system? Oh, by the way, the other thing is built 1.7 billion people don't even have identification. <laughs> they don't have, you know, they don't, they don't have a, ID, let alone self-sovereign ID, so they can't get a bank account, so they're underbanked. So, so you have this situation where you're sitting here, you now can get a wallet simply by signing up for it. Uh, you can get a stable coin simply by having it sent to you. You can generate yield against that stable coin. It might even start to you know, rival banks or be better in some safe way, which I think we're seeing now, uh, that, is, that is safer. You can have stable coins that are over collateralized and are baskets of other assets, tokenized assets. And you're going to start to say, well, wait a minute, this is far more stable, sustainable and equitable than this opaque, corrupt uh, fractional banking system. So I'm not saying that that it's, you know, it's going to undermine the existing world order. What I'm going to say is that people are going to recognize that there's something really empowering and valuable here to to leverage. And I think even the existing governments and banks, there's not about uh uh, undermining them. It's about giving them a way to safely, I think, deploy next generation technology to elevate people and to give them standards of living and access to the to the um, financial services that we never could before. Wow. There's a lot, lot to marinate on that you shared. Um, I will say, in spite of that like profound opportunity, there's a lot of essence in terms of your our earlier conversation about your desire to connect people that I found true to the world of, of NFTs through the membership experience. Like I at NFTLA and people met each other in person that had been part of communities um, for months and their reunions were almost like they'd known each other for years, like centuries in terms of their depth of connection that they felt. So in a lot of ways, I now appreciate sort of how this came about from this concept differently than I did before our conversation today. So I'm grateful for that. And we should definitely talk more about NFTs in, in a lot of different forms. I would love to, especially I want to learn about your communities because the, you know, the, the, the networks that do tear us apart, that's not all bad. As I say, we don't want, we're not replacing. We just, we want to augment and being able to, to get people together that are not close geographically and create affinities, affinity groups that are not, you know, relegated by accident of birth and where you happen to be and to connect that way is, it has a lot of value. So I don't want to, you know, we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and say, let's not create online communities. In fact, we do want to. We just want to create better ones that enhance our experience. Yeah, and there's obviously quite a lot of potential intersection points with AI ethics and NFTs and opportunities where I think NFTs could be beneficial. Also, probably some some risks that are created if, if you combine these technologies without the right sort of forethought. Are there any sort of intersection points that you think are particularly 
um, underrepresented in terms of the conversations that are happening in the space and, and ideas that you have around how these two worlds intersect that you want to share? Sure. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, your conference, which is coming up, uh, what's the date in March? Uh, um, oh yeah, it's it's this year. It's it's more. It's actually more decentralized. It's it's a NFT LA Community Week this this time around because yeah. you know you don't necessarily need a, a conference to create a, a community or a community doesn't necessarily need one place to go. It exists throughout LA, right? Yeah, yeah, it does. And I think uh, for those of you in town, we'll we'll be hosting a, a gathering at Batham House and talking about that. And I think we'll, we'll make some announcements there that maybe answer your question a little better about how some of these technologies are coming together. Because we've had some insights that are, I think, no less profound or interesting than the first NFTs that we can start to bring to the communities and ask people to play with. Like, like all these things, the value isn't in the idea, it's in the execution, it's in the people that come together to explore it. And and uh, bring it to life and uh, really appreciative of what you've done for the LA community and and um, I'd like to contribute to that. And so we'll, we'll, we'll make some announcements and throw some things out there there. So just a little teaser uh, for that one. Um, and uh, I think the other thing that you're gonna see in, in the coming months is a real adoption by the mainstream uh, groups, the companies, that typically put their toe in the water for quite some time before it just becomes part of how they work. I remember when I was asking everyone to get a website, they're like, why would I want a website? You know, I've got a brochure, I got a TV commercial. Eventually, no one asked, why would I want a website? They asked, you know, how do I get a better one? Well, the same thing's happening with these technologies and the convergence of these technologies for practical purposes is now hitting a tipping point where people aren't asking like, well, should I do it? They're asking, how do I do it better? How do I make it effective? How do I, how does it affect the bottom line? How do I do it ethically? And so what you're gonna see in the coming months are things like grocery stores that are gonna be able to accept NFTs. You're gonna see uh, you know, large banks that are gonna be able to use these for loyalty systems and automotive companies and organizations, uh, um, even, believe it or not, even segments of governments are going to be uh, not just looking at how do they stop bad actors, but how do they empower good ones? We're, we're, we're at a tipping point where this technology has gone through an experimentation phase and now we're going into an implementation phase. Well, very exciting. And this has been a really incredible conversation. The views and opinions expressed on Edge of NFT reflect solely those views and opinions of the show hosts and its guests. Please make sure to do your own research. Our show is not financial advice. You understand that you are using any and all information available on or through this podcast at your own risk. Whenever making financial decisions, we recommend doing your own research and talking to your accountant for financial advice. From time to time, we may feature sponsored content on the show for which we receive value, and we may share links for which we receive a commission if you make a purchase through one of those links. Refer to our website, www.edgeofnft.com, for our full disclaimer, terms and conditions, and privacy policy.